Welcome everybody. For today, our presentation is about banking. Last week, we had a small introduction about finance and the world of international finance. And we looked at financial markets, what financial markets are. And now we're moving forward towards uh, banking. And we will understand today what, our bank, what banking is, the evolution of banking, and the different types of banking that we have today. So for today, what we're going to discuss together are four main topics. First of all, we'll delve into history. We'll look at the history of banking, what happened, how did it evolve. Obviously, we'll be looking at modern banking, and then we'll progress into discussing the different types of banking. After that, we'll look at central banks and what roles central banks play. And finally, we will have an in-depth discussion about what central banks do and what kind of relationships they have with the financial markets, how they help the financial markets maintain their functions. So without further ado, when it comes to banking, the evolution of banking or, or modern day banking could be traced back to the 1600s. Before the 1600s, though, before the introduction of the new services, before the introduction of the banknotes, the very first modern day banking institution that was recorded could be traced to Italy, where the Banco Monte dei Peschi in Siena was the very first banking institution, modern day banking institution. And that kind of concept was then exported throughout Europe. And so from there, that kind of banking institution, which was basically a way to store money, a way to store the, whatever money that individuals had, progressed into becoming an institution that produces and that issues its own banknotes through silver, that were backed by silver or by gold. And what happened after that is that once we had the innovation of banknotes, the United Kingdom developed the Bank of England and introduced the Bank of England. And the Bank of England was basically the very first bank in, in a central bank type in, in, in Europe that was overlooking the issuance of currency. But with that also, the, there was an introduction of another type of, of a banking institution in the UK as well, which was known as regional or country banks. And these were basically regional banks that had similar authority in a way to the Bank of England, where banknotes were as well issued through these institutions. And then we moved towards having a joint, a joint stock banking institutions. And here we had mostly privately held banks. And one of the very first type, one of the very first banks in, within this category was basically the London and the Westminster Bank, again in the UK. However, this bank did not in the end have the authority to issue currency like the other previous banks in the UK. But of course, issuance of currency then became something of a monopoly for central banks and not then for commercial banks per se. With that in mind, if we want to progress again and see how commercial banks and banking in general, the banking industry in general progress, we could see the introduction of a new service by the banking industry, which was basically their function as clearing houses. And to make things as simple as possible, clearing houses means basically the facilitation of transformation of funds from point A to point B. So basically, the banks here act as a mediator between the um, the buyers and the sellers. So they make sure that the product actually exists, whether it is a security or a stock, they make sure that this exists. And at the same time, they make sure that the funds for these products or services also exist before they facilitate the transaction between A and B. Now, after this, we had a new product that was again introduced as part of the banking industry. And again, this product was introduced in the UK through the Bank of Scotland, uh, which is basically the overdraft function or the overdraft service by the banking industry. And then after this, banks started giving out business loans and private loans to individuals and also to businesses. Now, with the introduction of loans, we have to emphasize that the saving function of the banking as an institution remained part of its core services. And now this, this kind of service has even evolved to, to, to offer some sort of mortgages as well for 
holders of the account within a banking institution. But with all of this in mind, after that, in the 1700s, as the banking industry started to progress even further, we had a new function that was introduced to the banking industry, and that was trade financing, where basically investment banks in specific have been able to grant loans to facilitate international trade. And the whole idea behind this was to make sure that the national economies are stimulated, which means more creation of jobs, which also helps in the end, the economic output of a particular country. And so trade financing became a very, played a very important role as within the evolution of the banking services. Later on, jumping into through history in 1900s, banks started offering credit cards and consumer loans. As you can see now, credit cards are very much at the core of an everyday life, whether this is through mobile or whether this is through our daily purchases or even our online purchases. And as technology advanced, we can see how the reliance now on new products and services became to increase even more. So think about online banking uh, within the 1990s. And then after that, in the mid 2000s, how the introduction of mobile banking came to play an important role in modern day banking. And every, every period in history had its own unique milestones for the banking industry, for the services that were introduced for the banking industry, and for basically consumers who benefited from these kind of services. Now, with all this in mind, perhaps it is very important for us to try to understand what are the different types of banking. And here we could mainly divide them into two different categories. So we have depository institutions and then we have non-depository institutions. Let's start first with depository institutions. So depository institutions are basically financial institutions that generate or obtain their funds from basically accepting deposits from individuals or maybe from businesses. So their whole function or the whole key of how they operate is by accepting funds from the public. These come in different types or in different forms. For example, you have credit unions and credit unions are basically member owned financial institutions. These financial institutions do not necessarily, they are financially exempt because again, they are non-for-profit institutions. They basically pool money and funds from these different members and whatever money that is pooled by these, by these members that basically gets loaned out to, um, to the members who need basically to get loans. Now, Normally, the way that these institutions function, credit unions, by providing loans at very favorable interest rates, and these basically are only available for members. So non-members cannot be benefit from the services that are offered by credit unions. With credit unions in mind, we have another type of institutions, financial institutions, that provides similar services to credit unions. However, these what are known as thrift institutions, they don't only provide their services for their members, but they encourage home ownership or getting out mortgages for the purpose of owning homes and houses. Now, these kinds of institutions or thrift institutions, they're very much centered around providing their members only the facilities that would enable them or the loans that would enable them to acquire homes or to purchase homes. For example, in the U.S., there is the Navy Federal Credit Unit, an association or financial institution that, that only serves veterans of the, merit of, of the Army and helps them acquire loans at favorable rates to fund their mortgages and to buy new homes. Now, in addition to thrift institutions and to credit unions, there is what we know as commercial banks. Every one of us have dealt with banks at some point of their lives. And these commercial banks are basically at their core financial institutions that offer different services for the depositors. So these depositors could, could utilize services like loans, they could get mortgages, and at the core, commercial banks accept deposits from depositors, from people, and then provide loans 
for depositors or for people who are doing banking services or using their banking services. And they facilitate the exchange of funds from one bank or from one institution to another. And they also facilitate the exchange of funds from one currency to another. How do commercial banks make profit? Basically, the way that commercial banks normally make their profit is through the interest rate that is paid on the loans that they give out to, to the people who have acquired the loan and for the fees that users of particular services would pay for utilizing these fees. Now, these fees could look something like the overdraft fees or overdraft charges. Also, at the same time, they could be late payment fees on the loans that was that were acquired. So there are two categories mainly, if we want to look at them, for banks to generate their uh, commercial banks to generate their profit, which is through repayment on loan and through charges on charges, basically, or fees on, on financial services. Now, if we want to look a little deeper into how they function within uh, how commercial banks function within the US in the US. These commercial banks could be categorized into two different categories. So we could have state banks and then we can have national banks. Now, starting first with national banks, national banks are a higher category of banks. So they are allowed to function across state territory. And because of that, they need to be chartered by the controller of the currency, which is basically a part of the Department of Treasury. And they have to have a charter basically to be regulated. So they need to be regulated by, by, the, uh, by the controller of the currency. On the other hand, you have the, you have the state banks and state banks do not need that kind of authorization from the controller of the currency. Rather, they can operate within the limits of the state that they are operating within or that they anticipate to operate within. Now. When we look at the other category of banks, there, these were non-depository institutions. And as the name refers, basically non-depository institutions are financial institutions that do not accept deposits from the public. And so these kinds of institutions, they enter into agreements to invest in securities. This is their whole business model. They invest in securities without accepting loan, without accepting deposits. One of the prominent examples about non-depository institutions would be brokerage firms. So brokerage firms are institutions, financial institutions that connects a buyer with a seller, a buyer of a security with a seller of that particular security. And in their role as a mediator, they facilitate the purchase of this, of these kinds of securities. And they help the clients, their clients by providing them with advice, by providing them with feedback and with the support that they need to facilitate the purchase or the sale of this particular security. The other category of non-depository institutions, other than brokerage firms, is basically investment banks. Investment banks are the opposite of commercial banks. Basically, investment banks do not accept deposits. Rather, what they do is they help institutions, they help organizations, companies um, that are looking to raise capital, they help them with that. They help them raise the capital and they act as intermediaries in complex transactions, in complex financial transactions. For example, they facilitate POs, they facilitate private placements. At the same time, they help with mergers and acquisitions. They help with asset management. At, throughout our presentations, we will also see the how investment banks play a role in IPOs and in private placements once we once we go into private placements and IPOs as a method of raising funds in the future. Now, another category of non-depository institutions are central banks. Central banks are normally financial institutions that have the authority to issue currency. So they have the authority to issue the currency, to distribute it, and as well at the same time, they have the power to control credit interest rate and inflation. And so these kinds of institutions could either be government owned, they could be owned by the private sector, or they could be a combination owned by private sector and by, by the governments. Now, we've seen the what central banks are briefly, and we will look into within the next few slides, we will look again further at what central banks actually do. But to understand a little more about their ownership structure, 
If we are looking at government-owned central banks, think about the Bank of Spain. The Bank of Spain is owned solely by the state. It's a government-owned entity. If we want to look at an example of a bank, of a central bank that is a private sector or that is owned by the private sector, think about the United States Federal Reserve, which is owned by a consolidation of commercial banks or different banking institutions or financial institutions. If you want to understand a little bit more about how financial, how private sector players and governments could own a, a central bank, think about the Swiss National Bank. These are all examples of the different category of the different ownership structure of central banks. And so the importance behind looking at what who owns central banks is because we want to see how central banks function. And part of looking at how central banks function, as we will see within the next few slides, you will get to know and you will get to understand that the way that the central banks operate very much have an influence, a direct influence on the economy and on the economy of a particular country. And so understanding who has the power of making these decisions is going to be important for us. Now, to move forward and emphasizing the role of the U.S. Federal Reserve. So the U.S. Federal Reserve is basically as we said, a privately owned institution. It is created to ensure that the financial system of the U.S. is sound and is functioning well. They have the authority to conduct monetary policy. And the way that they do this is basically by saying how money and credit conditions are within the economy of the U.S. Their authority also expands to regulate and supervise the financial institutions that are operating within the U.S. Now, the way that the Federal Reserve is structured, it's basically structured into 12 different regional Federal Reserves, Federal Reserve Banks. They are located in different regions within the U.S. And at the same time, there is a Federal Open Market Committee and a Board of Governors. All of them together, all of these three different parties together, make the U.S. Federal Reserve. Now, if we want to look at central banks and what kind of effects it has on financial markets, the very important first thing to remember for us is that not only central banks have the authority of issuing currency, but also in their role, regulate, through their role of regulating financial institutions, and in particular banks, what what, what central banks do is they make sure that there is a minimum capital reserve that is stored from each financial institution, from each finance institution that is formed within the U.S. There is an amount of money that needs to be stored at the Federal Reserve to ensure that should things go wrong, the funds or a pool of money is there to help at least pay back some of the debtors or some of the investors who have invested in within these financial institutions. Now, what happens if things go wrong and the financial institution collapses? Then we might have the option for the central banks to act as lenders of the last resort. Basically here, what happens is the Federal Reserve or the central bank, whichever institution it is in terms of central bank-like institutions would intervene and try to save a struggling financial institution. And the way that they do this is by providing them with liquidity, keeping them afloat, helping them stay in business. Now, another function that is very important for central banks is that they monitor and try to mitigate, they monitor systemic risk and also try to mitigate it actively. And the way that they do this is basically by supporting financial stability within the part within a particular region so within the region that this these central banks are operating and what they do again is should the need be to support a particular financial institution that is still afloat that is still solvent but has no liquidity they would then intervene and provide them with the liquidity with the support needed to help again mitigate any systemic risk finally another role that they play is by basically working on monetary policy, adjusting monetary policy, and trying to influence 
what kind of expectations the market have. And what this does, it tries to control inflation and it tries to control the demand on the currency that the organization or uh, that a particular country has on, on the national currency. Now, with all of this said, and with us having had a brief look at the history of banking, the different services and the different categories of and types of banks and looking at central banks and what central banks actually do. Let's try to think a little deeper and perhaps this is something for you to do at home. Try to think about what kind of role you think central banks could do effectively. So do you think that the role played or the role that they play in stabilizing inflation or that in ensuring the soundness of a particular economy is effective? If so, how do you think they are maintaining this, the effectiveness of their decisions? This is something for you to think about until we meet next time. Good luck.